This is the oral history of David E. High uh, of the Nashville Bar. David, uh, I know that um, I'll start out, I guess, give your family background. I know your father was a, was a chancellor, and um, I don't know what you'd want to say about him. Okay. My father was an attorney and a chancellor in Davidson County Chancellor Court. He uh, went to law school in the GI Bill after WW2. And um, my brother, Charlie, is also an attorney. He's retired. He was disciplinary board counsel for the BPR. Uh, my dad was a lawyer for many years before he became a country court judge. And uh, he's so a member of the National Bar for over 50 years. He was president of the Tennessee Trial Lawyers at one time. Wasn't yes. He? Yeah. Which I think is a, he um, did a lot of trial work, uh, criminal to civil, did some of both. Mainly his last part of his career, kind of like me, shifted mainly civil, personal injury. Did uh, did his career and what he did and, and what you learned from him, was that main reason why you became a lawyer, you think? That, I think him and my brother, I have a degree in anthropology from UT Knoxville. And we worked, I worked on some archaeological projects in Tennessee, Louisiana, Mexico. And I got out and uh, for a year, I continued to do that type of work. And I realized I was either going to have to go back and get a PhD to make a living doing that, probably be a teacher, which I didn't really want to do, or get some other type of degree. My brother was going to National School of Law. I said, well, I'll give it a whirl. I was working for the State of Tennessee Department of Conservation mainly during that year, during my first year of law school, doing archaeological surveys and projects. After a year of law school, I, I did well in it. I, I enjoyed it. And at getting my second year of law school, I went into the legal business. Uh, my first legal job, the district attorney's office was doing the link with child support cases then. And they had a child, newly created child support division. And I went to work 20 hours a week, a part-time investigator for them running down deadbeat dad. This was while you were in law school? Yeah, during my second year of law school. National School of Law is a four-year program. And so that was my first legal job was 77, 78, uh, part-time in the DA's office. And that new division was headed up by Tom Thurman, who later became deputy district attorney, and Marietta Shipley, who became a circuit court judge. So it's just interesting, my first job, I met two people that became pretty influential in the legal system. From there, I went to work for A.A. Birch Jr. He was a criminal court judge. Technically, I was a court officer, but he hired law students to be kind of a hybrid. You were a court officer, but you were also kind of a law clerk and, and do research and whatever else he needed done. That was really a fascinating job. Uh, I sat in criminal court for a couple of years, and I would say I had a front seat to the justice system there. I uh, watched jury trial after jury trial from everything imaginable to multiple murders to, to any crime you can think of. I saw a lot of very good lawyers, some not so good, but learned a whole lot working for Birch. He was a real pioneer kind of guy, a high moral character, and a, and a great guy to work for. Always to take the time to talk to you about what was going on, like to talk about the law and how it should apply. Uh, it's quite an experience working for him. He went on to become the first African-American Chief Justice of the Tennessee Supreme Court. Judge Birch, I know uh, he was a General Sessions judge for a while, and, and, and then he got promoted to the Court of Criminal Appeals. So you went to work for him when he was a judge at the Court of Criminal Appeals. No, Appeal. Court of Appeals. I mean, not the Court of Appeals. I'm sorry. sorry. The, the, the Criminal, criminal court. court. Yeah, the court. before the Court of Appeals. Yeah, that was my mistake. Sorry. And actually, and when I left Birch, I did go to work for the Court of Criminal Appeals. I worked for Alan R. Cornelius, who was the criminal court judge in that division before Birch got the job. And he'd gotten elevated to the Court of Criminal Appeals. And I worked for him for a year as a law clerk. 
and a really another really good experience. I would anybody that wants to have a legal career, if you have a chance to work in the system for a judge, appellate court judge, a trial court judge, you should definitely do it. Uh, judge Cornelius was a uh, WW2 vet, part of the greatest generation type of guy, no nonsense kind of person, but was also very pro individual rights. And I really admired him on the appeals. You did these huge records with you know, volumes of transcripts, and technical records full of pleadings. And if he was assigned to write the opinion, he would read every word of the record. He'd read the pleadings, the technical record, the motions, the orders, the entire transcript, everything. And I asked him one time, I said, why are you doing that? This is a, maybe a one issue appeal. And he said, you know, this is probably the best appellate review this guy's ever going to get. And I think I owe it to the, to the system to read every word because there could be plain error in that record or something that uh, an incompetent lawyer didn't do. Uh, there could be reasons where I would want to act on my own to take action. Very conscient, conscientious guy. And it also taught me, him and Birch and Denise both taught me how to analyze legal issues, how they thought through things, why they reached the conclusion they did. So it's a great experience if you can work for a judge like that. And uh, Birch and I remain friends uh, for, for the rest of his life. I really liked him and we were in contact with each other and uh, it was a great relationship. Did, uh, now these these uh, these clerk working as a clerk or you you did some of this before you graduated from law school and, yeah and some of it after you graduated most of it was while I was in law school National School of Law is basically a part time program so you can work and it's four years instead of three so I was in law school um, I went. When I went to work for Cornelius, I was still at the end of law school, and I worked for him while I was taking the bar, and on end of the following year, I worked for about a year for him. So, so the period of time you worked for, for Judge Birch, you were you were a law student. Yes. And and the period of time you worked for Judge Cornelius, you were you passed the bar. Part of the part of the time I was a law student, and part of the time I'd taken the bar, and then I passed the bar. I got out of law school in 1980, and I left the Court of Criminal Appeals in 1984. So, and and then did you go into practice uh, by yourself, or did you go into practice with somebody else, or what? I went to practice with a group of lawyers in an association where you kind of, you, you get your own clients, or they send you some, or they associate you on some basis on their cases, but each lawyer's responsible for a percentage of overhead and they kind of uh, keep what they kill. It's an the, association of attorneys. Right. With, uh, Garfinkel, Gober, Wilson, and Hine. Mr. Garfinkel was a very colorful lawyer around yeah. town. Um, a lot of fun to be around. Wilson was uh, kind of temporary of my dad's. He was a sergeant in the paratrooper unit during World War II. And, train people at Fort Benning where my, my dad went through parachute school. And Gary Gover, who was basically a, he had done some criminal law in his young years, but he's basically a personal injury lawyer, where Mr. Wilson, Mr. Garfinkel were totally, totally criminal, all they did. So, so I was with them about five or six years. And then I went out on my own in various office associations or sole practitioner from 86, all the way up to now, 2023. The last job I had where I drew a paycheck was the Court of Criminal Appeals in 1981. So I basically worked for myself. You were you were self-employed and you were you were not you were not partnered with any other lawyers. No. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> I think you practiced for a long time, I, I know, in the what's called the Four Square building. Yes. It's uh, where I think uh, they, uh, well, I don't know what's in that building. I know that uh, Doug Fisher had, Alan Fisher was right. in, that, in that office, and, and that building is what, four scores high with six? Six, yeah. 
it's right across from the courthouse. I had an office on Second Avenue for a while in the old trial lawyers building before they tore it down. And lastly, in the Court Square building, originally at least the office space from Doug Fisher, who was actually one of my favorite teachers in law school. He taught civil procedure at the National School of Law. And he, he was really a sharp legal mind, really an interesting person. So I went over and rented an office from him probably 20 years ago or more and uh, rented it on a handshake. And then later, years later, when he sold his interest in the building, somebody came down and kind of shaking their head and says, there's no lease between you and Mr. Fisher. I said, no, we just shook hands. And they were laughing about two lawyers doing business like that on a handshake. But it worked out beautiful. He was quite a guy. Well, that's that's unusual in another respect in that I think uh, Ms. Fisher was generally an insurance defense lawyer. Right. You were more of a personal injury plaintiff. Plaintiff's lawyer. While I was in the building, I was probably the only plaintiff's lawyer uh, most of the time there. And the rest of the building was full of insurance defense lawyers. It did work out good. I got to know some of them. I got some referral business to them. And, um, it, you know, you got to learn how the other side thinks. Yeah. yeah. I know this. You introduced me to uh, uh, to Tracy Shaw, who I understand is a friend of yours. And, yeah. And, and uh, in my opinion, is the best mediator uh, for personal injury in those kind of plaintiff's cases. Right. Uh, and I used it many times. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Uh, you uh, you did uh, child support work in the VA's office, and then uh, you, of course, were a court officer. And I think you, uh, in, at the outset of your practice, you did a lot of criminal law. Is that right? Yeah. So the firm I went in with, the association, it was two criminal lawyers and one civil. And I had a background working court. Court of Criminal Appeals and Criminal Court, Davidson County, knew a lot of the players and the DA's office and the clerk's office. So it was a natural thing for me to do. And also I could do appeals. And there were a lot of lawyers who didn't like to do appeals, especially the older one. And I picked up some appellate work, you know, on the criminal side, some from Dan and Bill and some from other lawyers. And I also uh, worked with Gary Gober trying civil cases with him as second chair and learning how to do it, how to take depositions and those sorts of things. So uh, I tried cases with Mr. Wilson, Mr. Gover, both jury trials and uh, got my feet wet. Uh -huh. After you got your feet wet, you tried some of them on your own yeah. or just, just as a sole yeah. attorney on? Yeah, doing criminal, I would get appointed cases and employed cases. And probably the first... 15 years of my law practice were heavily in criminal law, which was fascinating, uh, but I got a little tired of it and it was easier, to, more profitable to make a living in civil than criminal. Um, and I got to try a lot of jury trials in criminal law early, early on. You know, I got my license in 80, 81, I was in private practice. I was trying murder cases and stuff like that by the mid 80s. Um, I've so tried had a lot of experience in jury selection. Right. And, and it does, and that helps you later in the civil war. Trying a jury trial, it's a little different. It's the same how to handle yourself and how to do things and the rules of evidence, four dire, how to pick a jury, how to give an open statement. They're that, not that much different between civil and criminal. And this, this day and time, a lot of lawyers are having trouble getting trial experience. Back then, if you were willing to try criminal cases, you could get a lot of experience really quickly. What uh, would you, could you say of the criminal work that you did, would you be able to maybe make a guess or, or an estimate of how much of it was appointed cases and how much of it was cases where you're, you're charged with being? Early on, it was slamming more towards appointed but then I got it pointed paid very little back then. It's a five hundred dollar cap unless it was a death penalty case. Still doesn't pay very much. No, and so if you couldn't get your case settled, you did the jury trial for nothing. Bad system, you know. <laughs> real conflict. 
either convince your client to take a deal or, or we're not going to pay you for the trial. You're on your own. That's the system they've created over there and still they, have to some degree. They have, uh, well, we, we have a public defender system, but as I understand it, uh, you know, the appointed cases are usually when there's a conflict of interest. A lot of them, yeah. Was it that way at the beginning that you, when you did it? Yeah, they weren't quite as active as in my early days since they became later, as far as having bigger staffs and being able to take, sometimes they were just overloaded with cases too. But uh, I've tried murder cases, double murder, looking at the list here of jury trials, habitual criminal, burglary, escape, so a couple of vehicle homicides, drug possession, counterfeiting, theft of property, rape uh, trials in front of the jury. I mean, just about everything imaginable, uh, counterfeiting in federal court. Uh, so it was a real experience to jump in there and trial those types of cases. And and it, you were doing both federal and state criminal cases. Yes, yes. Uh, I think when we talked before, you said there was, uh, I asked you if there were any of the particular cases you want to talk about. Uh, you had a vehicular homicide case that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, it's funny looking back at cases that you tried that are still kind of stick with you. Uh, one of them was a pointed murder case that, you know, really didn't make any money on. And I got appointed by a criminal court judge who called me over and said, what do you have on your calendar like two months from now? I said, well, nothing. He said, well, you want to try a murder case? Okay. The other lawyer had gotten off the case and he says, uh, he said, I don't think it's going to settle, so we need somebody to try it. Said, okay. So I went to the DA's office and I said, Well, what's the offer on this case? And they said, Life in prison. I said, Well, I looked and filed. There's no death penalty notice. Now we're not seeking the death penalty. I said, Well, it's not much of an offer. So it turned out it's a real kind of a meek young man that had shot and killed someone at a at a bar in the parking lot, we found out that he and the family of the victim had had an ongoing feud in the neighborhood, and they'd actually shot him the year before, and he had a couple of bullet holes in him, and I got the medical records from that, and I had pictures of the bullet wounds, and I got a bunch of neighborhood witnesses that knew about the threats going back and forth and how violent this other guy was, and Ended up, we tried the case, and he got a, convicted of manslaughter. He got a six-year sentence, which was a, a lot less than a life sentence. Uh, and, you know, it's something you didn't make any money on, but it's one of those that kind of still sticks with you. You think about, you were, you know, glad you were able to you know, help this kid. He was a young guy, you know, get his life back on track. Um, and the other one we talked about, I was represented a, a childhood friend that we'd gone to grade school on up together, and he got arrested for vehicle homicide. And I represented him, which because you there's a lot of pressure when somebody you know somebody and it's a criminal case and they can go to prison. So, a lot of these vehicular homicide cases are cases that if somebody had been killed, it would have been a DUI case. Yeah. He uh, had some alcohol on, on board, but not enough to flunk the test at the time, and was also allegedly speeding, going to high rate, very high rate of speed. And uh, so, in that case, it started out that he made some incriminating statements in the ER, but I got his medical records, and he'd had his spleen removed because he had internal injuries from this, very serious injuries. And I went and talked to the surgeon. And the surgeon told me that in his condition, he would not have been competent to make legal decisions such as waiving Miranda rights in the ER, in his opinion. He was suffering from shock on drugs and all that. So I thought we had a really good suppression motion and I argued it and unfortunately lost it. But the DA, uh, I think, was worried about the appeal of that issue and, and some other weaknesses in the case and offered a six month sentence with a sentencing hearing to see if probation be granted by the judge. And my client says, yeah, I want to do it. And he goes up to the plea 
goes through all the colloquy, you know, 20 minutes worth of questions about understanding his rights and what the deal is, and that nobody was threatening him or promising him anything but the deal. And they get to the end of it and says, well, how do you plead? And he just stood there. And after a second, he finally said, I'm just going to have to plead not guilty. And I said, can I have a minute, Your Honor? And I talked to him, and he explained to me why he didn't want to do it. And we had a jury trial, and he was acquitted and found not guilty. That's a lot of pressure when you knew someone that well and had to represent them. Uh, after that, I thought better of representing anybody I was that close to. <laughs> but, I, but, but when you're young, I knew he had a good suppression issue, and I just, you know, it's kind of jumping at the bit to jump in there and try to win that for him. And I uh, ended up having to do a jury trial. That's the one that you're, you're really proud of, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now, on these notes, you've got double vehicular homicide and vehicular homicide. Those two different cases. Right. It was one case where it's kind of an unusual case. It was two people were killed in the accident. Hmm. And there were two people charged with vehicle homicide. And... Uh, they were only convicted of DUI. My client was convicted of DUI, but not a homicide. So that was a pretty interesting jury trial. When you say two people were killed, two they, different cars hit each other. Two act, two car accident. Yes. And the and the both uh, drivers were charged. And you didn't represent both of them. Oh no, because you would have had a conflict. So so did did both of them get acquitted? I remember if they either were either got acquitted or a hung jury. But they were never retried on the homicide. They're just sentenced. So I think that they, I think they, either one, but they were only convicted of DUI, both of the drivers, not the homicide. It, was that trial a battle between you and another attorney representing the other? And, and the state. And, and the state. Freeway, freeway free for all. Pretty interesting case. You, uh, during the period, of course, we've gone through a period of uh, where. Drug cases were a large part of the the uh, criminal practice, and uh, now uh, the situation has changed a good bit because they're legalizing marijuana in a lot of places. It, did you handle a lot of uh, marijuana cases or drug cases? A lot of drug cases. Um, right, one in front of the jury back when the jury did the sentencing. That was yeah. pretty interesting, and uh, yeah, the guys were facing up to life. Big case, and they ended up getting 16 years. Did you think that uh, it was better when the jury decided the sentence or better when the judge did? Well, it's easier to convict somebody if you don't have to do the dirty work and send them to prison. When the jury had to get both convict them and send them to prison, that was a heavy burden. And I think that played in the defense's posture. When they first passed your uh, judge sentencing, they put in the statute that if the defense lawyer filed a request, the judge had to tell the jury how much time these charges carry. And that was the law for a good period of time, but it's no longer the law. The DA's finally got that taken back out. So now the jury doesn't know how much time somebody's facing. Well, I thought and, back uh, when, when, I, when I did criminal law, I thought that that uh, when they had uh, jury sentencing, uh, it had the advantage that if the district attorney was wanting to really throw the book at your client, but you thought there were mitigating circumstances, you could yeah. try the case and you would lose and that your client got convicted, but you might get a, right. they might set the sentence at a, at a lower rate because you were able to show the mitigating circumstances and get some sympathy from the jury. So it was the early 80s, they changed that to judge sentencing. I don't know the exact year. One example of jury sentencing that helped me is, is a pretty interesting case. The guy, a guy was charged with escape. And he, when I meet him, he's like this 60-something-year-old man that looks older than that. He's back in prison. And he had been convicted of murder. Uh, and, and robbery him and another man, I think there's two of them, of a grocery store owner in East Tennessee. He had pled guilty and got a life sentence. 
Well, back then, after 20 something years, you were eligible for parole. So about the time he was coming up for parole, he's on a, a, a work detail outside of the prison. Where he was like a trustee. One day he just decided to walk off, walked off from being a trustee, went to East Tennessee, got a job working in a moving and storage company, and lived there seven years. Not, no problems. He was involved in a minor tra car accident, tra traffic accident, and ended up getting arrested and sent back to prison. When his boss at the moving and storage company came and hired me in Nashville to represent him from escaping from the state pen. He's gone seven years. He thought that much of him. That he's, he said, I have a moving and storage company. He had access to people's stuff. He never stole anything. You know, he's a great guy. So we tried that case. And I remember I, I got a picture of my old client's old mug shot when he first went to prison. He's this young guy. And then this old guy sitting over there now. And argued to the jury that that's not the same person. And was able to put his boss on the stand about what he had done those seven years. And it was carried one to five, but they had a quirk in the law at the time that if sentence carried a minimum of one year, the jury in their discretion could commute the sentence to a sentence in the Davidson County Jail or Workhouse. So very unusual case. So we get through arguing the case and this juror is crying during my final argument, I thought, this is good. <laughs> I turn around and sit down, my old client's back here just bawling. And he had gotten her to start bawling. And so the judge instructs the jury, and she's still upset. And at the end of uh, the jury instructions, she raises her hand, and the judge says, ma'am, can I help you? And she said, I can't vote on this case. It's too emotional. I know somebody in a similar situation, and I can't vote. So when they said that, I, I'm jumping up and telling Judge Why, well, she can't vote, they can't convict you. <laughs> She's a juror. And finally, he said, well, I'm going to put the alternate in her place. And so he put the alternate in the place. And they went out and deliberated and came back and convicted him of escape and sentenced him to seven days in jail. One day in jail for every year. So I filed a petition to suspend the sentence and brought his boss from the movement and service place back down there and said he had a job waiting from him if he ever makes parole in his murder case. And the judge said, well, I think it's kind of silly to make this guy finish his sentence and when he gets paroled out, come down to the Metro Joe for a week. He said, I'm going to suspend the sentence. And he suspended it. So juries often try to do the right thing like that. So when you had the, but now a jury just says guilty or not guilty, and they don't have any idea. And some of our statutes are crazy on sentencing. They don't have any idea how much time somebody's going to get. They're not doing any of the dirty work like they used to. Well, that's that would be my sentiments. I mean, I thought yeah. we were better with, with the jury sentencing, but uh, you know, it was not my call. I didn't. <laughs> I had one vote, but <laughs> yep. The uh, 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 you had a case, uh, let's see, the, the Richard Jackson murder trial that you wanted to talk about. That's the one we've already covered, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, did you often uh, go to trial in, in rural areas outside of Nashville? We did a few, and I think when we were talking, it's interest in trying cases in rural areas. Um, one of the cases we involved with, uh, we're going to be up in this rural area for a, a week, uh, and we wanted to get a motel room in the town, and, and it had gotten a lot of publicity, so we tried to get a motel room, and they wouldn't let us stay there because the jury was staying in the only hotel. We had to go to one town over. And there's a guy that wanted, it was on the jury panel that was a reporter, and he had written a stack of stories about my client in the case. Yet he wanted to be on the jury and oh, he could be fair and he wouldn't consider any of this other stuff that he's written or heard about my client. He decided just on the evidence. And finally, the judge, you know, after a while, excused him and left the jury box, went to the front row of the courtroom, got his notebook out, 
started writing stuff down. And I guess he figured he's going to be there for the whole trial anyway, reporting on it. He might as well be on the jury. So, and, and in that case, I went over the jury list with a local lawyer down there who's later a judge. And he could tell me intimate details about nine out of 10 jurors, you know, who played golf with the chief of police and who didn't like the DA because they had a kid in jail and on and on. And I kind of wondered, what am I doing up here? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's, yeah. You know, so I after grew- that, I, I kind of had the attitude. I wasn't going into a rural area or out of county on any sizable case unless I could have a local guy work with me. And that turned out to be a pretty good rule. And uh, I would I would agree with you because I came from a small town and, and uh, I kind of know what your small town lawyers had to be drawn and the small town people. And, uh, but uh, as I say, you can, well, let's put it this way, as a criminal lawyer, you, you can try a uh, case uh, being from out of town if you plan to appeal. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so, I mean, you know, if it doesn't work out, you you, you have, have your appeal ready. We, we got a mistrial on that rule case for the reporter. We're happy to have it, and ended up we never had to go back and settle after that. The uh, what we're gonna say? There was another aspect of. Uh, so after I learned how to kind of had a try civil cases with Mr. Gary Gober, I started taking more and more of them and slowly morphed, morphed to a personal injury lawyer than a criminal and eventually got out of the serious criminal business altogether and was just doing personal injury, auto, slip and falls, medical malpractice, products liability. Uh, we did some vaccine injury claims in the United States Court of Federal Claims. Uh, interesting practice. Uh, one thing I think that criminal law gave me a good perspective was I wasn't really very nervous on the civil side because my client, everybody was going home. The yeah. case is over. Right. It's not like somebody's going out the back door to prison and it's just money, just talking about money. But it's but it's the money that you earn. A I lot mean, of you it know, was how much money, money you earn. In state cases, a lot of it was my money too. <laughs> right. But I, I learned to feel like when I felt like I was like I was taking myself too serious about a case, get too wrapped up over it in the civil side. I take a deep breath and say, hey, "Look, it's just about money. Win or lose, life's going to move on, and uh, you know nobody's going to prison." So I think that perspective actually helped me in the long run. Well, I think it's a good perspective and I, I think it's probably hard to attain because, uh, you know, you you, uh, you take a lot of cases, the civil cases on contingency fees, yep. where if you don't win, you don't get paid. Third of nothing is, is nothing. <laughs> I learned that the hard way. <laughs> and, and I would suppose that, that your civil practice was primarily that kind of case. Yes. So, yes. so it, it uh, kind of a, you know, affects your pocketbook. Uh, but, but as I say, it, it, it was good if you could um, take the perspective that nobody's going to go to prison. Right. Of course, the other thing about it was uh, the joke I remember somebody telling uh, that. Uh, Somebody goes to the lawyer that wants to, to maximize his fee in a criminal case, and he says, uh, "He says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm I'm really worried about this case. I'm I've got, uh, you know, I've got uh, uh, the, the the client says I've got a uh, uh, charge with this murder, and I'm worried about what's going to happen." He says, "I've got a hundred thousand dollars." He says. And the lawyer turns to him and says, well, I don't know of anybody that had $100,000 to go to prison. Some of them do, but right. I didn't have many clients with that kind of money. But that's but one reason I ended up, yeah. Is that the $100,000 is going to go to the attorney. So right. <laughs> when he goes, I got you. <laughs> he doesn't know you got. <laughs> yeah. You probably heard the joke, too. <laughs> Represent them to their last dollar. <laughs> Heard that. Yeah. Well, I, so, well, 
but that would discourage, I mean, if your clientele was like that, I mean, if you were trying to maximize your income, you, you would uh, you would try to scare your client in, in criminal cases and about how the consequences of what was going to happen and, and then, uh, you know, persuade him to give you all he had to, to keep out of prison. I never did that, and I don't think you did either. No. But as I say, some criminal lawyers do that. In the earlier part of civil practice, there were a lot of trials, but now there's not that many trials because of ADR and mediation, which you talked about earlier, has eliminated a lot of trials. Um, and I know some young lawyers are having trouble getting trial experience with these big law firms. Uh, but back in the old days, in the 80s and 90s, in particular, uh, early 2000s, the, uh, both the bar was trying a lot of civil cases, a lot. And now they're just trying to view. Yeah, that's, that's a change in the, in the practice of law, and yeah. probably not only in this city, but throughout oh, the country. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, now, you had uh, uh, Did you ever use your archaeological knowledge in, in your practice of law? Not much. Um, I, I did have one little case where it was an issue of where an old graveyard was. It was apparently bulldozed away, whose property it was, but we determined that we really couldn't say for sure. It was kind of a mess. But I spent some time dealing with a state archaeologist and all on that who I knew, and it was kind of fun to deal with it. But I. I never really blended the two other than that one event. Uh, the, uh, did you talk about some of the uh, personalities, people you've known? You, you mentioned Judge Birch, I think, and you talked a little bit about him, uh, and Judge Cornelius as well. Uh, were there any any people that you practice law with or or you uh, were, say, a clerk for uh, that you would describe as a mentor, somebody that uh, taught you? Uh, well, yeah, I think Birch and Cornelius, of course, were, and also my father. Uh, it's kind of, it was probably the best of both worlds. It's hard to work and practice law with a relative, you know, some father and son firms and all. It's not easy. But I kind of had the best of both worlds. He was sitting there in the courthouse, and I could go over and bounce things off of him and get his advice. But I didn't have to listen to it. No, I, I, I could nod with him, but I could, then I could go do whatever I wanted to and not be second guessed. But I got his advice a lot. He he really uh, was kind of a legal scholar. He liked to deal with legal issues and dissect them, and he was a, a big influence. There was never any issue about whether y'all would practice together or anything like that. No, he really liked being a judge. He'd been a trial lawyer and, you know, tried all kinds of cases. So he was a judge at the time you became a lawyer. Right. I was in college when he became a judge. So I was up at UT. So well before law school, he was on the bench. So, so there would have been no opportunity right. for y'all to practice. And together. then when he retired, he retired from work. He didn't want to go back to work. Uh, he just retired from the bench. And did not go back into law practice. So, did, oh, he, did he retire at sixty-five or no? He was well into his seventies. Yeah. You don't have to retire when you want. You, you don't have to retire if you're a judge. You can stay on until yeah. you pass on if you yeah. want to. Yeah. He, he, uh, yeah, he, ne he didn't want to go back to law practice. A lot of judges don't. I, I know that others have retired and it wasn't really comfortable to go back. He says, one, one friend of mine that his dad was a judge and he retired. He said, uh, when I was a young lawyer, when I was a, when I was a judge, everybody laughed at my jokes. He said, the same lawyers used to laugh at my jokes are now saying, where are those interrogatory answers? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so not nearly as much fun. <laughs> Yeah. So, well, you know, 
judges, judges are lawyers are nice to judges, but it's not always sincere. Yeah. Yeah. That same judge said, I'm not nearly as funny as I used to be. <laughs> yeah. So uh, then uh, I did some work in medical malpractice. And that was, yeah, there was one that was, you wanted to talk about, I think. That was pretty interesting. Uh, I enjoyed the challenge of that. Uh, you would have to learn an area of medicine, all the lingo, all the buzz terms, the treatment options, what's accepted and what's not. And really uh, learn the area of forwards and backwards to represent your client. So, and then the lawyers on the side were really some of the best in the state. And they have really good lawyers to defend them. They give them a blank check, and you're lucky to dig around and come up with one or two experts, and they have half a dozen to choose from on everything. So, it's a tough area of the law. And we learned that. You had to be real careful in what cases you took. Also, the expense was high. We had several cases where we had, you know, hundred thousand dollars plus of our money tied up in the case. So, as a sole practitioner, uh, either doing the case on your own or you may be working with one other lawyer, mm -hmm. still uh, the expenses and the amount of work was uh, really significant did you uh well did you associate who did you associate with um, most of the medical malpractice cases you worked on um i mean other attorneys uh, yeah i've i've been associated and associated early on i was more uh other lawyers were bringing me cases do you think this is something we could prevail on and i would do it you know with them and we would help do the, the work together and the expenses. Uh, I've done some work with Joe Bednars, who's a great lawyer. I associated Joe, and uh, Joe's still going strong in his 80s in the practice of law. Um, the uh, medical cases were uh, very challenging, but very rewarding if you could prevail on them. Yeah. Uh, did you, was any other attorneys that you worked with on medical malpractice cases? Yeah, um, we went with Jeff Garrity from Jackson, Tennessee, that we did together that ended up being a uh, case that's a uh, reported case. Uh, Jeff and another lawyer, myself, did that one. Uh, we lost it the first time and it was then it confidentially resolved down the road. Uh, but most of them, and I've done some work with some guys from out of state, um, but most of them, I was the person, you know, most of them I uh, was doing on my own. Uh, one case I did with uh, Pellegrin and Boyers was a VA case. And um, Veter Veterans Administration Hospital here in Nashville. Uh, most of the cases that you handle on the medical side, if it settles, you can't talk about the settlements or the amounts and that sort of thing. It's confidential, yeah. But uh, the one against the VA is not because it's a governmental entity. It can't be confidential. It's operational law. So, so tell us a little bit about that case. That case, uh, a veteran got what they call Gillian Barre syndrome. And he came down and ended up in the hospital. I believe it was Christmas Day. And then, like the next day or so, he, he has. What is Gillian Barre syndrome? It's a neurological disorder. They're not sure what the cause is, but it can affect your ability to use your lower legs. And I think it's probably caused by a virus. Or we're not real sure, but the treatment is it, you can become partially paralyzed, paralyzed. To, in your legs, and you can work your way up your body and gets to the point where it affects your diaphragm and breathing muscles. They have to intubate you or breathe for you. And uh, unfortunately, this client, um, right after the Christmas, we went into Christmas and the weekend between Christmas and New Year's, where you know probably nobody really wants to be working in the hospital. Uh, he met, deteriorated and he started working his way up his body to the point where it's affecting his breathing. And the people that were 
should have been watching him, uh, weren't appropriately watching him and monitoring him and reporting to the doctors. So he ended up with a brain injury from inability to breathe on his own. So uh, if, if he had been treated uh, as he should have been, uh, what could they have done? To they, would have, they would have, uh, int when it started to affect his breathing, they would have intubated him and put him on a breathing machine. But that had been temporary because eventually this would, the, the IV, IG antibodies, different treatment they give, this, this condition usually resolves and goes away. And over 80% of the people end up with uh, uh, at least able to have normal function in life after that. Did he, uh, uh, well, you, you, uh, you had to hire physicians to, to oh, yes. as, as expert witnesses yeah. in this case. We had a couple, yeah. And uh, we're taking a lot of depositions, yeah. They were outside the VA and yeah. uh, the, uh, did the VA doctors testify? Uh, the attending doctor did, yes. And he was very defensive about it. And um, then our ex we came up with our experts. And also, what kind of off the case around was more the uh, uh, information dealing with the, the nursing staff and the respiratory therapy staff. The staff at the hospital um, didn't modify, didn't really watch him at all like they should. For instance, they were supposed to notify the doctor if his breathing test got below a certain amount, and it did, and they just didn't notify him. And uh, there was a nurse that treated him. I remember that uh, didn't really know what his diagnosis was. Oh, shit. So she and, and admitted that for that diagnosis, he wasn't sure how they should treat him. Mm. Uh, so it was pretty bad care. And eventually the government you know, caved in and worked out a settlement of that case. What was the settlement? That case was $3 million, $2 million cash and a million in a, what you call an American medical visionary trust. Yeah. The, uh, so those cases can be quite good for you. And yeah. How many of those kind of cases would you say that you handled? Over a period of 15, maybe 20 years, I would generally try to only handle one or two at a time, usually one, because I had to make a living and pay my bills and it Plus, there was a lot of outgo money wise to fund these cases. So I would generally lim really limit how many I've taken, but we've had cases involving emergency medicine, ER, orthopedic surgeries involving one involving the elbow, one on the back, one on the knee replacement, gallbladder surgeries, ophthalmology, drug errors. They give either the wrong kind of drug or way too much of the drugs. Um, so we've had a variety of uh, obstetrics dealing with childbirth. So we've had a wide variety of different types of cases. And each one of those things, you have to learn the medicine good enough that you can talk to the talk, that you can cross-examine these medical people and know what all this stuff means, what the buzzwords are, what the standard of care is, you know, what you're supposed to do, what you're not supposed to do. And so it's a lot of work to learn all these different areas of medicine to learn enough about it to present the case. So you have to, well, you have to direct examine. You've got to know the right questions to ask. Like, and in cross examination, if they say something that is not uh, standard medical practice or, right. or something that is is not contrary to what what the treatises say they should do, yeah. you should you have to know that and, and point it out. <laughs> In their question, in your question, cross examination, you've got to, as as they say, you don't ask a question in cross examination if you don't know the answer. So, I, I did a number of those cases for a number of years, but I, I did not do a volume of them due to the complexity and the fact that I also had a general law practice involving workers' comp, auto accidents, those sorts of things. Would you say? Well, I guess. Uh, for how long would you say your practice was civil primarily, and how long was it was it primarily criminal? I say the first um, ten to, ten to twelve years it was heavily criminal, 
And then after that, it's shifted to civil. In the last 20, 25, we're mainly civil. Uh, for a while, I, I haven't done major criminal cases in a long time. For a while after that, I would still do a general sessions case or something. So, you know, my friends' kids get in trouble or something like that. Or if a case came your way, you're... but major criminal cases I haven't done in, in a good while. Any of your criminal clients that you you uh, represented and and years later found out what happened to them uh, is good or bad? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, in that line of work, um, they, a lot of them end up back in trouble. Some of them end up dying early, you know, early deaths if they're into substance abuse and that sort of thing. You know, all that kind of seems, a lot of that goes hand in hand. Yeah. And then some of them have gone along to be very successful people. You just made a mistake. Too many clemency cases or, you know, no. not much of that right now. Uh, you, uh, Parole before the parole board, or very little. Yeah. You mentioned, I think, Judge, I mean, Doug Fisher, as being a, a very fine lawyer that you, I think, had a good relationship with. And I, did you ever go up against him in a case? Yeah, we had a Chantry Court case together and we worked it for a while and it eventually settled. Yeah. So we did. Yeah, I've been against him. And had a lot of cases against his firm over the years. Did uh, uh, who would you say would be the best uh, uh, trial lawyer that you you've known? A lot of really good ones. Um, and uh, you know, think about some of them that I really like their style. Uh, I would say Randy Kennard. Uh huh. Mr. Medical Malpractice, and I really like his style. And uh, could you describe that? How he? But, and I, I liked uh, Joe Binkley Sr. and uh, Ed Yarbrough, David Raven. And there's a lot of good lawyers around. Um, and one of the things that I've seen with all these guys that are good is they're always professional. They're nice to people. They don't gut somebody until they show that they deserve it. Um, it's kind of hard in court, right? In court, it's kind of hard to explain, but they they handle themselves very graciously and professionally in front of the jury. They never act like a jerk. Uh, and when they finally go after a witness. They've established a basis that the jury's probably agreeing that it's time to go after them. And they, they have that sixth sense and ability to do that. And all of those types of guys I've mentioned are that way. And they're some of the most professional people you ever deal with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, did, uh, I said, you know, well, Gary Gober and Bill Wilson, who I both practice with, great speakers, very great orators. And uh, it was fun working with them because they could really give a wind up speech, both of them. Uh, Get a closing argument. Right. Yeah. The, uh, uh, you belong to the uh, uh, Ends of court for a while, I think. I was in the Harry Phillips Ends of Court for a while here in Nashville. And then later, I moved to Williamson County, my residence, even though I've always practiced in Nashville. And you talked me into being on the Williamson County John Marshall Ends of Court. And I was in that for a number of years. I just rotated off last year. After 42 years being a licensed attorney, uh, closed my physical office in May, uh, end of May of last year, started rotating off some things. Other organizations, you know, National Bar, uh, Tennessee Trial Lawyers, I've been pretty involved with them, really like their continuing legal education. And the American Association of Justice, uh, that's been a great organization. It used uh, to be called the American Trial Lawyers Association. Yeah, it used to be called Adler, Association of Trial Lawyers of America. 
Um, what I've liked about them is I've got into some areas of the law where there was, you know, doing a vaccine injury case or uh, doing a, I'd ended up doing some cases under the Federal Tort Claims Act uh, against the VA hospital here, against Blanchfield Army Hospital in Parksville. And they're under the Governmental Tort Liability Act where you try it in front of a federal judge without a jury. It has very kind of complicated procedures about how you get there in the claims process. So AAJ has, has a group that does Federal Tort Claims Act group, subgroup you can join. And I joined that, and it's amazing. I mean, the, the guys and gals that are in that group know that inside and out and, you know, can keep you out of all the mistakes that are in that type of different litigation. And uh, whether it's, you know, Federal Tort Claims and other things, I, I had some, uh, a birth trauma injury case, and I'm joined the APA Birth Trauma Injury Litigation Group. And I went to probably four or five seminars on birth trauma cases over two or three years. And I was working on that case because it's so complicated to learn the lingo and the medical literature and the standards. Birth trauma there refers to the, to the uh, trauma of the, of the child or the trauma yeah. of the mother? Mainly the child. In those cases, it was the child, yeah. Failure to do a timely cesarean section yeah. and end up with neurological damages. Uh, so those types of cases, uh, I found those kind of groups invaluable. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, if you're a lawyer, there's something you want to learn. There's a group somewhere you can link up with through these associations that's going to teach you how to do it. And the National Bar has a lot of committees, federal court, and other things that. Lawyers can get involved with the farm practice. If you're a plaintiff's lawyer, do you think that that if you thought any plaintiff's lawyer could help you because they had a similar case, that you could call them and they'd help you? A lot of them will. A whole lot of them will. Uh, a lot of them will want you to associate them and do it with you. <laughs> and you know, and if they're going to do more than a phone call or two, they you probably should associate them. And, and yeah. They encourage lawyers to associate other people and share the fee so that ultimately the clients will be the best served is, is the rationale. But, um, and, and I suppose you can also, uh, they are a good resource if, in a case where, where an expert witness is involved. If right. I've had experience with that expert witness, you can talk to them and they yeah. will tell you, uh, well, if that is an expert witness against you, they might tell you what things you might need to know to right. question that witness. You're going to go through yeah. a lot of prior transcripts. And yeah, I think one reason the medical profession is so successful in defending cases here is one insurance company represents 80, 90% of the doctors, especially when you get out of Vanderbilt and these big institutions that have their own coverage. Um, and they have literally the book on. They, for years, they kept all the depositions and all the reports, all the experts. And you're limited to have an expert in Tennessee or a state that touches Tennessee. That's all you can use in your case generally. Right. You can't bring in experts from California or New York City or Miami. So they pretty much have the book on all these experts that are coming into Tennessee to testify. And all the prior transcripts and, and know how to handle them. You probably, uh, I don't know, but but uh, if you you can use other lawyers as a resource to find experts. Yes, that's you can. That's some share more than others, but yes, I've always thought that the only medical malpractice case I ever tried, I, I hired an expert through a service, and I found that. The doctor that I was using was was getting seven hundred dollars a day for the trial, and but I was having to pay the service two thousand dollars a day for him. That's and, a bad deal. And yeah. after that experience, I found that I would contact experts on my own. I would not go through a service. Right. I I got most uh, some from services, but I would use the ones where there was just a flat fee for. Giving you the CV and then you dealt directly with the expert on the billing. Yeah. So, uh, you know, 42 years of practice has been very interesting. Uh, 
never a dull day, so to speak. He never knew what was going to happen from week to week when he went to work, what new case was going to come in, what developments. And you're dealing with all these different people with all these different issues. Uh, so it, on the other hand, it's stressful because everybody we're dealing with is stressed out. So the legal problems that brought them to see you are very serious problems that cause a lot of stress. And the judicial system, um, I think that the discovery system for plaintiffs is really overbearing. What the defense can push a, the honest plaintiff through on a small lawsuit is incredible. You know, you know, get, you know, digging through all their old medical records and tax returns and uh, IMEs. The doctors are going to say whatever the defense wants them to say. I think the system is not really very fair to plaintiffs on how much information you have to give up uh, and how, you know, they can take his deposition all day and on and on. Take his wife's deposition, his mother's deposition. Uh, the only thing you can do about that is retaliate. Right, which the defense lawyers like if they're on the hour. <laughs> yeah, you throw the dog above. Yeah, but yeah, but I, I, you know, you you have to. Yeah, discovery is is you have to use your imagination to figure out what what evidence might exist. Or in criminal cases, you have very little discovery, and if a witness won't talk to you, you know, nothing you can do about it. Right. Uh, and I think you know I've dealt with that. I did have one case where a client was uh, charged in Tennessee and Arizona years ago. And I went out there and found out that uh, in certain circumstances, they can take the deposition of witnesses in criminal cases. And I got those depositions and it was invaluable to my client. Something we'd never gotten here. Yeah. Well, I, I took a deposition in a criminal case not too long ago. Uh, because it was the sister of my client. She was dying of cancer. She served evidence, yeah. But discovery is not, not exist yet. Well, I appreciate it, Mr. Cheatham. Well, I don't know. I think there's probably some other questions I could ask, but I can't think of what they are. Uh, the uh, You've had quite a, a practice. You've done a lot of good service to, to the public, I think. And uh, I think I think you, you've done so well, and I'm surprised you retired so young. Well, it's a young man's game. I mean, when I was a young lawyer, I thought those old gray-haired guys were the you know top of the heap. But after a while, now I would think that you know maybe guys with 20 years experience and still have high energy and high motivation, you know, kids tuition to pay and all that, and working really hard, they may be the best. Uh, Bloggers out there. Is the internet had an impact on your practice? Oh yeah, especially the medical. Back when we were doing a lot of medical stuff, we used to go to Vanderbilt Medical Library and try to dig up an article or something. It was very cumbersome. We used to hire nurses and stuff to go out there and do it. Now, I mean, you can find anything on the internet. You can find experts. You can find articles. You can find standards. And uh, it's incredible. Uh, internet has really changed the ball practice. It, it really has. As far as discoveries, you can find out things. I uh, had recent experience with cases, federal, which uh, not medical mal, but I, I really admire you for medical malpractice because I, I decided to, yeah. you know, not to get into it after I had one unsuccessful uh, venture into it many years ago. And uh, as I say, I, I know all the obstacles. And that is another question I wanted to ask you. You said that you evaluate the cases. What percentage of the cases, the medical malpractice cases that referred to you, would you uh, turn down and not accept? I'd say only one out of 10 calls would we even make an appointment with them. Would that be? Nine out of ten would, would never make it past a phone call. Would that be because the, there was no medical malpractice or because you didn't think you could uh, 
it wasn't a case we wanted to tackle. There's certain types of cases like people get infections and they just happen. It doesn't mean they have a case. You know, a lot of stuff like that. And so I found out it's amazing how many people were mad at their healthcare providers the way they were treated. Uh, and but yeah, nine out of ten calls we would not even sit down and talk to them. And then out of those, you'd have to go. Is it worth going to step two and get all the medical records? And then it's just, is it worth going to step three and have doctors evaluated and nurses and so forth? Were there some cases where you thought there was uh, medical negligence, but the amount of damages you could recover in oh, yeah. the situation was right. because it would require a tremendous amount of time and effort on your part and expenses? Yeah. To, to, in to cases your hands could not justify taking. Yeah. yeah. And like they had to redo a surgery, but the person's really no 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 different than they were if they hadn't made re, redo it other than a bad experience. You can't always take those on. You'd have to generally have some serious permanent personal injuries from the malpractice before we could really justify jumping in. It would have to be a medical result that, that would be unexpected with the type of situation condition the person had and therefore you know and significant enough to so justify the time and money yeah yeah um yeah. uh, you did a lot of appellate work you said just early on i was doing criminal for other lawyers and for myself um but i didn't stay in that very long i, I was uh Something I knew how to do, having worked for criminal appeals. Mm -hmm. In the first 10 years, I did a number of appeals. I've had cases, you know, in Supreme Court, and, and, and I've been to Cincinnati, uh, Sixth Circuit. Yeah. yeah. And those were mostly criminal cases? Both, but Both. more criminal than civil. So, as I say, you, you, you're retiring at a young age, huh? 69 doesn't feel too young, but yeah. But but you've had a good career and uh, you've done a fine job, I think. Appreciate it. And I know I know no personally that a lot of I've worked with you. Thank you for everything. Thanks for interviewing.